Thank you, Jason and Simon, for joining this session. And I'll not take any more time. Simon, Jason, over to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. So uh, the title of this talk is, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, Media Rays, uh, if I think that's Latin. The, the idea was stolen from Star Wars, where basically they just throw you in the middle of it um, and you know leave it to explain the beginning 15 years later. Um, I figured we, uh, Simon and I, um, we kind of picked a couple of stories, three stories that are some of the less frequently told stories. I think a lot of people know the origin story, the absolute origin story for Selenium, but we wanted to pick some that are more in the middle of the life of the project uh, to kind of go from there. Uh, you can still hear me okay, right? We can hear you. Excellent. Uh, so jumping into the middle of things. Um, but before that, speed running, yes, I started the Selenium project, right? So that was 2004. Uh, and I'll always remember uh, the age of the project because that was also the same year that my oldest son was born. So if I can remember his age, I can remember the, the project, right? So uh, two interesting things happened in 2004 to me. Um, but very quickly, yeah, started the project 2004. And then jumping into literally our next story, uh, our first story is uh, 2007. Um, at the Google Test Automation Conference. Um, anyway, but again, we're going to tell you three stories. And just like the slide says, the adventures we've had, the lessons we've learned. And I'm all, I realized uh, I'm already violating my speaker notes here. So before we actually get into that story, Simon, I should let you introduce yourself. Yes. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, I'm Simon Stewart. Uh, I am the uh, creator of WebDriver. I was the lead of the Selenium project from shortly after the 1.0 release until shortly after the 4.0 release, um, which was a heck of a long time. Um, I uh, started what was WebDriver, which became Selenium WebDriver, uh, while I was at ThoughtWorks a long, long time ago. Um, and then I left ThoughtWorks to join Google. And then somewhat weirdly, I left Google to join what was then Facebook is now Meta um, to work on build tools, which is nothing at all to do with browser automation, um, which is a bit unusual. And I am currently working at a, a large um, IT company, uh, working again on, uh, on, on distributed builds, um, which I find incredibly interesting and fascinating, um, but also, Sort of, I always managed to find a way to bring that back to the Selenium project somehow. Um, so I'm still involved. I'm still doing all sorts of, I call it janitorial work now, sort of go around and I sort of fix things that are broken and that nobody else really wants to have a look at, uh, which is good. Um, as Jason said, we're going to share some stories with you. Um, do you want to start with that first story, Jason? Yeah. Just checking to see if we actually had any speaker notes for that second slide. Nope. We do. We do. <laughs> Got it. So, so this the stage was set. It's funny. Um, uh, until recently, um, and we've been joking about this for for many many years. Uh, we were the top Google search result search result for steel cage knife fight because if you find this video, this was effectively a lightning talk. We both gave longer talks at the Google Test Automation Conference in New York in two thousand seven, but this was the final talk where we basically. We, we we teed this up as these two testing tools and it's gonna be a steel cage and I fight. And we ended up compl com switching roles and complementing each other and whatever, but it ended not with steel cage and I fight, but with a lot of um, uh, projectiles being thrown around the room. It was very fun. You should watch the video. Um, but anyway, uh, but I think they rechanged their uh, search algorithms. So now um, I think they some did. Other, we, we other stuff shows run. up. So, so we, we need to tweak, we need to tweak the, uh, the search algorithm for that one. Um, but the reason why this is story number one is because at this point, the, the Selenium project is three years old. This is why it's in media race. So we're jumping ahead three years in. Selenium is um, king of the world, whatever. Um, and uh, Simon had created this upstart tool called WebDriver. I, ironically, we both started this when we were at ThoughtWorks. I, at the, but at the time of the video, I was at Google and Simon was just a couple of months from joining it was at ThoughtWorks in a couple months from joining Google. Um, and the key thing was a year before this, I actually went to, uh, I was based in the Chicago office. 
Simon was based in the UK office. I got to go visit. We had this like study abroad program internally at the company. It's a cool company. Um, I got to go hang out in the, the London office for a week. And there was this internal conference and I got to see the very first version, like an internal first release version or, or preview of Simon's WebDriver project. And uh, my big takeaway from that, again, this is like 2006, so a year from <laughs> before this little thing. I was not impressed at all. Uh, he was speed running all the mistakes that I was uh, that I had made in the Selenium project, um, implementing the fit framework, which I love Ward Cunningham. I love the fit framework. But if you ever wonder why in Selenium IDE or um, like it's got a very weird table like structure that goes all the way back to, to the beginning of the project, go look, Google up what fit in the fit network, uh, fitness fit framework, look, whatever historical story for another day. But um, Simon had done all these things that I had said, oh my gosh, that was a mistake. We should do something else. And so I, I saw it, but I didn't tell him this. I was like, ah, I'm not worried. Selenium's still going to be king of the hill. A year later, though, at the uh, test automation conference the, the, in New York City, that the, this is a screenshot from, um, Simon gave his talk. And I remember being blown away. He basically fixed every problem that I saw and, of course, never told him <laughs> in WebDriver. <laughs> and I was basically like, this is the Selenium killer. I know this is almost a meme of some one tool killing the other. Um, but this one, the, the key thing was 80, Selenium solved about 80% 80 of the problem. And there was architecturally no way to really fix that last 20%. But with WebDriver, it was pretty obvious that Simon uh, did. And so instantly I, I realized that, you know, my, my next task is uh, Simon's either my biggest uh, next a best friend or my uh my worst enemy so i figured like oh hey let's let's um let's join forces right um so this was basically where the idea was hatched to uh merge projects and kind of give seleniums like its next growth curve i think if we hadn't merged the projects um selenium probably would have been a footnote to history by 2008 2009 um so that's that's my kind of take on this is basically like selenium had um i think this is well, we'll get to the lessons learned later, but I'll just touch on this. It's like, it's good to uh, be humble and recognize weaknesses and, you know, be open to the the, the, new, the cool new things that people uh, do. Simon, did you have kind of, what's your side of the story? What's my side of the story? So um, I, I tried to use a really early version of Selenium on a project uh, that I was working on at ThoughtWorks and found that I couldn't, get the server running reliably. And so my tests were kind of flaky, but that was fine because we were using HTML unit, which was just like pure Java emulating a browser in, 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 in the uh, tests that we were doing. Um, and I'd written this sort of wrapper around it called, uh, had two classes, one called web element, one called browser. A guy called Joe Walls had a similar framework where he had element and uh, his main class of represented a web browser was called web driver. It's like, that is a great name. Can I borrow it? It's like, yeah, sure. It doesn't matter. So we did that. Um, and on that project, our tests were running super fast, um, but the client wasn't happy because they didn't believe that the tests were doing anything. Uh, so we described the actual safety of the tests as high, but the perceived ones as being low. Um, and so we integrated that um, API with a web browser, and that ultimately ended up um, leading to this talk at, at GTAC, which was great. Um, when I gave the talk, uh, I kind of knew that sort of Selenium RC and, and WebDriver were on sort of parallel paths. And it was either going to be an absolutely massive slugfest with Jason and Paul Hammond and a group of people that I really liked. I really liked the people who worked on, on Selenium, or we were going to merge the projects. Um, and one of the things that helped push that over the line for me was when I joined Google, they still had 20% time. Um, and Mark Striebeck, who was one of the test engineering managers at, um, at Google said like, you should stop doing this web driver thing. Like Google are settling on Selenium as their testing framework. Um, and so it was like, yes, I think choosing Selenium is an excellent choice, Mark, and that's what you should do. And then we merged the project. Um, and so I carried on working on the thing that I enjoyed, which was good. I can't, I, I can't remember. If, I'm not sure if I knew that part of the story. But yeah, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> it, it's quite fun. Now, the, the problem is, as Jason says, the architecture of Selenium RC 
um, allowed it to iterate quickly, work with all the new browsers, solved like 80% of the problem, but the 20% left was really hard to solve. And the way that we solved it with WebDriver was we integrated incredibly tightly uh, with the browser itself. So um, Internet Explorer, which you may or may not remember, is um, a series of con controls dressed up in a trench coat pretending to be a browser. And a con control is um, an underlying sort of API provided by Windows. Um, that was fine. We managed to get work working. Firefox has a thing called XPCOM. Um, they were trying to do what Microsoft did with the component object model of Comstock. Um, and they had the beginnings of a distributed XPCOM. So there was a server socket. Uh, and I remember demoing to Jason, telnetting into Firefox to make it do things, which was part of my demo at GTEC. Um, Paul Hammond, who is at ThoughtWorks, described me as very foolish for attempting to integrate tightly with the browser because it meant that every time there was a new browser, I'd have to do another version of the things. And, and that was really problematic. And the thing was that Paul was right. Um, and if we go to the next slide. But to say, uh, we, we were worried that we were going to have enough to fill 30 minutes and realize we're halfway through and we've only gotten to story one. <laughs> we will go faster. So on to story, <laughs> on to story number two. Is this yeah, the on transition? To story, yes. Um, all right, as you were saying. Sure. Or, or, um, or is this, uh, this is where, yeah, sorry, uh, every, uh, we knew the uh, transitions uh, were going to be awkward. Um, <laughs> right, so, so the, the key thing here is that there is this story of the Selenium project kind of scaling up and growing up. And on a parallel track um, behind the scenes that we were uh, trying to get the project, the IP of the project into kind of a neutral and basically into a some kind of nonprofit or some kind of neutral playing field um, that was kind of going on at the time. Um, and the other thing that was happening, the project started in 2004, but there wasn't a conference. So here we are, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know what number of uh, just the um, of Selenium conference this is, how many there have been, but there've been a lot, but imagine a from 2004, the first real Selenium conference, there was in, it was in 2011. Also, there's um, the Selenium camp that happened in Kiev, um, Kiev, sorry, um, also right around that time. But imagine that many years, there was nothing. Uh, there were maybe some user group meetings, very ad hoc, whatever. So by 2011, we finally decided, look, I think the community is big enough um, and let's do a conference. So we're trying to kind of get all of that going. So finally, um, not just looking at this as a technical project, but it as a community building project as well. That was happening in 2011. Also, I was uh, started uh, Sauce Labs in 2008. So we were um, uh, trying to help the project in all the ways that we could. So one was getting the 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 kind of nonprofit, kind of the IP thing solved. One was standing up conferences. Um, and then along the way, there was also came kind of this technical way to kind of scale the project. And I'll, I'll let uh, kind of Simon talk about this because it uh, literally basically the, the part where the, the title of the slide, Andreas, the opera driver in W3C, I'll let Simon explain all that. So uh, yes, in 2011, um, at the very first Selenium Conf, I think it was, Andreas Tov Tovson, um, I think before Selenium Conf, there was actually a water day. Like Water was one of the other frameworks, and it was run by Brett Petticord, who'd introduced the world to Selenium in, in the original post. Um, I think Brett also gave the op opening keynote at Selenium conference, I think. Again, there was yeah, this so. theme of like wanting to be a very, uh, what they call it, big tent, large umbrella project, making sure we're welcoming to everybody. Yeah, it, it, as a little side note, I remember the first day of the actual conference itself, Jason and I were sort of walking into the venue and it was a workshop day and we thought there was going to be five people there or something like that. And the room was absolutely packed. Um, and we realized like this is going to be like a really exciting few days. Yeah, um, we had actually picked a very small venue. I think we it was the Marine Memorial in San Francisco. I think it could only hold 150 people. And we were worried about selling out the ticket. So we wanted to pick that classic, you know, pick a small room. So you know, it'll look full. Uh, we didn't realize that we probably could have filled it three times over. But again, this is the first conference. We had literally no baseline on what to expect. Um, yeah, it was, <laughs> Very cool. that was a learning curve. So yeah, at that Selenium Conf, Andreas Tol Tolson um, did a demonstration of some work that Opera had been doing in order to um, 
get things working. And in 2012, we gave a proper talk um, about the work that had become Opera Driver. Um, and the thing that was different about Opera Driver from any of the any of the other implementations of WebDriver is that it wasn't open source. It was um, developed by Opera, um, and they they provided like the bindings and went like, here's the things you need to do. But they had developed everything and they'd done all the hard work uh, in order to control Opera using, I think it was a scope debugging protocol. Um, so the, this concept of let's use a debugging protocol to control the browser appears to be pretty old. Um, and the first time that Andreas demoed the, um, the Opera driver, somebody in the back of the crowd went, oh my God, because it was so fast. It was unbelievable. Um, and I was like, yes, if you have the browser vendors helping write the implementation of the web driver, that's really useful, but there's no way we could ever get that going. And then um, in his talk, Andreas has this slide where it's like, have we thought about a standard automation API for browsers? And I was like, we couldn't possibly do that, could we? But then with the backing of Opera, um, the Selenium project was like, maybe we could. Um, and so we went to the W3C and we went, wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of web driver spec that we could do? Um, and to our eternal amazement, that is what happened. We started working with the W3C to, to do this back and the, the browser vendors came on board. And at first it was like Opera, Mozilla, Google, um, they were there, the Selenium project was represented. And then for a few years of these talks, um, John Jansen from Microsoft would sit there. He was normally doing stuff with the CSS working group. And we'd say, are, are Microsoft gonna join this? And he's like, no, I'm just here observing. And then suddenly Microsoft were there and then Apple were there. And we realized that actually like this W3C spec that we'd been working on was actually being implemented by every single major browser vendor. Um, and it was a, an astonishing moment. And after about seven years of hard work, we actually shipped the W3C web driver spec. Um, and like that was possibly one of the most awesome moments, whereas this thing that had started off as a little API that we would use for doing some testing um, had suddenly become uh, a standard. And clearly, like that meant that the browser automation wars were all over. Um, right. They must have been over, right? Well, the. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's the cue for the next slide, right? So I think for people who were um, uh, not born in the previous century, um, which is kind of crazy, mind blowing to think. But if you Google the phrase browser wars, that was that was a thing in the 90s. That was like it wasn't a hot war um, like the actual real wars, but it was it was a pretty intense time in the tech world. Um, I guess maybe anything this, the closest similar thing to it now would be the AI wars that we're in, where various tech giants are are, um, uh, you know, making huge announcements and rapidly innovating things, and it's a very exciting time. But back in the '90s, it was the browser wars, right? And so I think uh, all those years later, in the middle of the Selenium web driver project, um, it was an almost an unthinkable thought that we could get all the browser vendors to cooperate because that's you know. And at a certain level, there's kind of the Selenium project is kind of like the United Nations, if you want to get too political here, where we're just kind of keep trying to uh, get everyone together uh, and, and, you know, do make the world a better place, as they say, right? The, the cringy way to explain it. Anyway, by, but by we, the time we had the W3C standard, we effectively, you know, thought this is my emoji for uh, world domination, <laughs> mic drop, right? So basically, we're done. It's over. We've accomplished everything we needed to. Um, there's nothing else to do, right? Uh, but of course, that last little subtle end of that sentence goes from an exclamation point to a question mark, which leads us to story number three. Jason, eight minutes remaining. All right. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, story number three. Um, we are in the modern world. We'd uh, managed to ship Selenium 4. We were feeling quite happy about that. Um, but people were starting to talk about other testing tools. Uh, the, the the one that came first was Puppeteer uh, and then Playwright, uh, and then Cypress and then Playwright. And the thing that was different about these tools is uh, they used the Chrome debugging protocol, going all the way back to what the Opera driver had done. They used the browser's debugging protocol to control it. 
And the problem was that on the Selenium project, we'd been really focused on shipping uh, the W3C spec um, and, and sort of putting like a, a new low watermark uh, for browser automation. And uh, we then sort of spent a lot of time rewriting the internals of Selenium and, and making it a, a more stable product. Uh, and we sort of didn't have the time or the energy or the, the capacity to really think outside that. And these other tools did. Um, so um, in one way, we'd become a bit too comfortable. And in another way, we were just super busy because Selenium is an open source project, right? The open web is a wonderful thing, but it grows when the community develops and, and helps do things. And uh, everyone on the project, which had started sort of 20 years ago, had been through some very major life changes, um, which was fantastic. But the nice thing that happened was because these tools arrived, we had an opportunity to sort of sit back, reassess and think. So, um, you know, what were the things that people wanted to do with these new tools that they couldn't do with Selenium? And it was clear that what we needed was to extend the WebDriver protocol to support bi-directional communication, to have the browser be able to send events back into the, event, into the test, and for the test to introspect into the health of the browser itself in different ways. Um, people wanted more from their tests. They wanted to be able to, to, to do all these things. CDP offered that, um, and the original WebDriver API did not, uh, spec did not. The interesting thing though is CDP shifted with every browser release. It was really difficult to keep track. Uh, and the wonderful thing with the W3C specs is they are stable. So when you write your test to the spec, you know that that test will continue working tomorrow, six months time, two years time, 20 years time down the line. Whereas if you rely on the CDP, you can't. Um, so we are now focusing quite hard on uh, improving the uh, WebDriver by spec to support the use cases. The other thing that these new tools did is they took care of driver management for you. They took care of browser management for you. You installed them, everything worked. And with the recent Selenium 4 releases, we've baked in a tool called Selenium Manager. That will also take care of the browser and the driver for you. So now you can just pull in Selenium to your project, do new Firefox driver, new Chrome driver, and bam, the browser will be there and everything will work the way you expect it to which I think is quite nice. Right. Um, and Jason, do you want to uh, add anything? Yeah, also just, I think the things uh, that we've learned, the project has learned, I mean, now that they are, there are multiple options, uh, the developer experience is super important, good docs, good examples. Um, I think when kind of Selenium was the only game in town, people kind of suffered through the uh, whatever particular friction points were because it's like, okay, well, you, this is what you have to go through. Uh, you have to okay, walk on this bed of glass, <laughs> eat these nails, <laughs> whatever. And then at the end of the process, hey, you've got a, a you've got an automated browser, right? But that's not good enough. And, and everything needs to be really um, smooth and awesome, right? So, uh, you know, big lesson there. Don't get comfortable and really keep uh, pushing things forward. Do we go to our pontificating lessons learns? We can kind of we can go to that. All right. We only have a couple like minutes left. Minutes so left, right? this is the point where it starts to seem like a commencement speech for some college where we just look back, look over the horizon and, and say, OK, listen, listen here. Um, but yeah, so three stories. But there's some of these some of the lessons from the whole entire project. But these in particular was that there was um, it's really important. Uh, it was pr important for me personally going back to that 2007 uh, conference where I saw Simon's project where um, there was, you know, I could have taken a, a different tack where I just like, nope, I'm going to crush him <laughs> right? for whatever. Uh, but no, it's important to stay humble and realize um, jumping around here, but you know, good ideas come from anywhere and uh, we can always, we can always improve things. Right. And in particular, it was really important, this combination of staying humble, but also knowing knowing the project's weaknesses, knowing my weaknesses. Uh, and then that means I'm always on the uh, the lookout for, you know, finding uh, like-minded individuals who can kind of, who can help there. Uh, that's kind of a mashup of those first three bullet points there. Um, <laughs> do you want to take the last three? I'll take the last three then. Um, so the other thing that's happened in the modern age, like the developer experience is more important than ever. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do with Selenium is support a really great um, uh, developer experience. 
Um, but the other thing that we're trying to do is to stay true to being an open source project. Like we are part of the SFC. Uh, people on the project have contributed to uh, to, to various standards um, and have worked at companies such as Mozilla, uh, keeping the, the web open. Um, and part of that is that we believe that open source is a force multiplier. Like there's only been a handful of people working on, on Selenium at any one time. Um, but there have been so many contributors coming in and going like, here's something that doesn't work for me. Here's an improvement I could do. Like the entire documentation is done by volunteers who are like, look, I needed this in my language. I know how to do that. They have done it. If the project was an open source, we would not have half the software, half the capability or half the community that we do right now. Um, and then the other thing as well is there's always the opportunity to carry on growing. Like we are trying to, to figure out like, what do we need to do in order to meet the needs of people? Um, so the name of this talk was uh, Emilia Res. Like we're jumping into the middle of the story, but we're not finishing at the end of the story. We're finishing in the middle of the story as well, right? And we're hoping quite sincerely that there'll be like a Selenium at 40 celebration at some point. Um, and we will see where the project will have gone because it will have been a fantastic journey. I think all that way. I have one thing to add on the open source is a force multiplier. Um, I, I have this metaphor that, uh, the Selenium project is like the Python project. Um, it will take, um, and be inspired by good ideas anywhere and bring them into the language. And so like that, the Selenium project is not done. We will take I ideas from anywhere and incorporate them, cor incorporate them into the project. Sometimes that can be a little confusing to people. Like, why is there these extremes where there's uh, a Selenium IDE, uh, and a Selenium grid? thing like where do they fit because like well there's different audiences that that um that need those things also if uh, you know uh sorry just looking at my uh, notifications here um if people say selenium is too old just for the just for the record um those the people who might be saying that are probably javascript developers and javascript is older than selenium so that <laughs> that's my one <laughs> little slightly spicy take i'll take you know jo no one says javascript is dead um and it's older than Selenium. So anyway, Selenium's not done. We are on our last slide. And I think we're in our final minute of actually our presentation as well. Uh, the big thing is we could not put all of the names on this slide. Uh, and so we just have to pay in very large letters, thank you to everybody. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to, this is the 20th anniversary, we'll try to do a, a good job of getting all those names onto a slide at, at some point. Um, but just I just from the bottom of my heart, I super, super appreciate anyone who's ever contributed anything to this project. Uh, we literally like it is your project. This is not just the same Simon and Jason show. Obviously, you know that. But, um, you know, I just want you to know that I know that it's a massive group effort uh, to get to this point. Seconded. Um, the, the interesting thing is, if you just take a look at the commit log of the documentation and the the, the main project, that doesn't tell you everyone who's been involved and everyone who's helped push this project forward. There have been so many people who do so much work that isn't even represented properly and clearly in things like commit logs. Um, the, this project has been an absolute pleasure to be part of and watching the community grow has been phenomenal. And you know, it's one of the reasons why I've stayed around so long because it is an amazing community to be part of. And that's thanks to all of you who are listening and all of you who have contributed. So thank you very much. Thanks again. And Ooh. I think I think uh, that's where we uh, drop the mic again, I guess. It definitely did. It definitely did. Uh, to pick up the energy again after that mic drop, let's look <laughs> at questions. And the most important question, Simon, is addressed to you. How can we get hold of T-shirts like that? Um, so, uh, I believe this t-shirt was one that was made for, um, uh, one of the, the developer meetups that we have. So the, the Selenium project, um, if you are a, a committer and you routinely do it, we have these dev summits where we gather together people into a room and, uh, we try and figure out like, how can we help the, the projects around us? Um, how can we improve the Selenium project? Uh, how do we know? where we're going to go and what we're going to put in Selenium 5, Selenium 6, Selenium 7. So they have these dev summits. And I believe at the most recent one, um, this was a t-shirt that was that was made for it, um, which I think is, it's a lot of fun. So in order to get one of these t-shirts, 
all you need to do is contribute regularly and routinely to Selenium and be invited to one of the dev summits. Awesome. That's a great motivation. <laughs> Not that we need a motivation to commit to Selenium. Uh, I'm sure it's there in a lot of people's mind. There are challenges of different sorts, but uh, definitely I hope this is one added motivation to come into Selenium as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Simon, do you, uh, Simon, Jason, do you want to look at the questions and answer them or do you want me to do that? Oh, I was uh, looking, uh, I was looking at the webinar chat. Uh, you, you probably had a chance to, well, there's only four. Which one should we do first? I'll let you decide. Should we can take it from the top? Yeah. Sorry, uh, so the first question is, 20 years of Selenium is a great achievement, but currently in many new projects, tools like Playwright and Cypress are in high demand. Community experts predict that Selenium usage may decrease over the next five to six years. What are your thoughts on Selenium's competitors? So, um, so oh yeah, so what do you want, you want you, to do? You go first, Jason, go on. Okay, so um, yeah, I've got some numbers. Um, and and I can see that the the kind of the um, the mind. If you want to understand the mindset of a venture of a venture capitalist, this is uh, almost the kind of question they don't care about absolute numbers. They care about uh, first derivative, um, your velocity and acceleration, right? Um, so there are absolute numbers that um, again, the lesson is to stay humble and not get too cocky. Um, because absolute numbers, Selenium is still killing it, right? But so did BlackBerry in 2008, uh, a year after the uh, the iPhone came out, right? So um, in absolute numbers, um, there's just, for example, on LinkedIn, there's a Selenium users group. There's 250,000 people in that uh, users group and in the Playwright uh, users group on LinkedIn. Granted, not everyone is all in the same things, but whatever, but there's 500. So 250,000, 500, right? If you go for LinkedIn jobs, uh, there's like, a uh, couple of thousand for Selenium um, and, a, I don't know, a couple hundred for uh, Playwright, right? So it's like an absolute number, Selenium is still, despite what everyone says on the software testing or QA subreddit, um, Selenium is still dominant in the industry. However, goes back to that lesson, staying humble. If if the if Selenium is massive in absolute numbers, but is not as growing as fast as, as Playwright and Cypress, yes, that, that's, that growth rate... Um, you know, people can see that growth chart and um, and can kind of predict where it's going to cross. Um, but we would argue that we do not believe in you know ossifying the project and just having it be kind of the steady state thing. Um, specifically, uh, that debugging protocol that Playwright and Puppeteer project uses. Um, that's some really good stuff. It makes everything go faster, and that's why we're bringing it into WebDriver by Die. So um, I think at some points. Um, I mean, as far as calling out Cyprus in particular, um, uh, I'll just say that that Cyprus uses the same uh, the same architecture as the very first version, my version that was effectively two thousand four to two thousand seven, um, and we deliberately moved away from that architecture. That solves eighty percent of the problem, does not solve the last twenty percent, um, and so there is, I feel like, lessons learned from the Playwright project that became the Bydie project or the Bydie effort, and um, I. I I don't think there's, and if you'll pick any industry, there's never just one dominant. Uh, there's only like one vendor and that's it. There's a Coke and a Pepsi. <laughs> there's McDonald's and Burger King, whatever. Um, and so I, I don't think Selenium literally dies and there's only Playwright. Um, I think five, six years from now, massive uh, spicy prediction here. I think, you know, Selenium will still be in the mix. It's not going to go away. But again, uh, we have to stay humble and make sure that we take the projects. It doesn't, it's not a, Fait accompli. It's not a. It's not a. Um, uh, it's not done. We have to actually intentionally make it better for that to be true. To add to that, I would say that sort of the great success for the for sort of for the first part of of the life cycle of Selenium has been the W three C web driver standard, and that's allowed other people who want to automate browsers to have a solid foundation to build on. The thing we're working on now, the W three C web driver by die specification, builds that foundation and extends that and makes it um, available for everyone. So um, one of the things we're starting to see is there are tools that offer you different APIs to access similar functionality. Um, because automating browsers, as we found out with, with the original web driver, is incredibly hard. Um, and having a standard that is implemented by the browsers is about the only way to do that without a massive injection of engineering time, effort, stress, 
um, forking the browsers, and sometimes you can't even do it because the source code is proprietary. Um, and so I think what we will see over the future is as WebDriver by Dye mature, matures, more things will sit on top of it, including Selenium, Selenium itself. And so what we will see in the next sort of five to 10 years, I think, is people will pick Selenium because the Selenium APIs allow them to maintain their existing uh, uh, infrastructure and their existing um, investment in their tests, but also because it's got an idiomatic API that feels like it belongs to those particular language bindings that they're using it in. But if people don't like it, they can flip to another tool, um, WebDriver IO or um, one of the wrappers, Selenide or Selenium Base, or something else completely like Puppeteer, and it will still be based on that same technical foundation. So you're going to have the same kind of capabilities. So um, it's just sort of pushing browser automation further down the stack. Um, and so you become like able to, to use the same technology, but in different ways, which I think is quite an exciting thing to happen. Yeah. Also, I, a month ago, uh, I think I joked about like the working title for this talk was something, something AI. <laughs> There's a, another spicy take that basically like, hey, if AI is going to write all the code, the API doesn't matter at all. Right. Why are we even talking about code uh, in five years? We're going to be talking about which which, you know, AI is the. Um, <laughs> It's doing all this stuff just like, exactly like it's a lower level level we don't like um you know we don't program in assembly anymore so maybe it, um all the actual browser automation apis effectively become that lower tier anyway this isn't an ai talk and that was in other talks but anyway who knows what'll be happening in five years right we'll all be um potato farming on mars maybe right <laughs> doing something else okay some of these some of these questions are getting uh more and more technical the lower i uh, on the list I go. Uh, what's the next question Which that we should answer? Should? I don't know. Well, uh, it's a good one. I don't know the answer to it, though. Uh, why is Apple so slow in adapting BiDi in Safari? Is it because it's not a standard set in stone yet? I, I, I don't know the answer to this. Apple don't comment on unreleased products, so we don't know. There you go. There you go. All right. I do recommend there is a, a subtle um, uh, thing that I guess that we've done on the project that's never been explicit. But, you know, if you want the answer to this question, I recommend whoever asked this, go get a job at Apple and make it happen. Uh, this is like, if you want, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm almost not kidding. Like, you know, the, one of the ways we get the browser vendors is like, you know, if you look at the history of all the people where people worked on the project, they were at Google and Microsoft and Apple, like, you know, hey, just like, go make it happen. Anyway, all right, next question. How do we see for Selenium consume a simple prompt as input with any development IDE gives us Selenium piece of comfort? Oh, this is a question about AI and will people be right. able to use it? So so um, how do we see for Selenium to consume? Um, I saw something that just came out like yesterday. Um, there were some researchers uh, from academia and industry, they were talking about this, not, not browser automation, it was mobile automation, but they were quite proud of their results. Um, they figured out a language model and that could automate mobile workflows. Um, I don't think it used Selenium or Appium under the hood. It was using like Android native APIs, but they were um, extremely proud of themselves because they got up to a 70 to 75% success rate um, on the AI automating from just a prompt. Um, so of course you're dyed in the wool, gray haired, um, been there, done that, get off my lawn. Uh, test automation people would say, um, failing 25% of the time is, uh, not great, <laughs> but of course the optimist, the, the humble developer would say they went from zero to 75% pass rate in a year or two. So who knows what we'll be in two years. So anyways, it's one of those things like state of the art right now, they actually literally say in their, their paper. This is the state of the art. State of the art is it fails 25% of the time, the AI stuff. And this is like the top tech people, the top brains in the world. So um, it, it might be higher in the future, but um, I think there's a certain level of, you have to kind of watch this space, but I don't think um, it's not over. Um, it's very it's very exciting, very interesting, but I don't think that the AI can take the jobs today um, and write all the tests now uh, because someone has to go in and figure out um, you know how to get it to, 
uh, AI is useful for augmenting what people are doing rather than replacing it. Um, right. So I fully expect, like, if it's going to be like, how am I going to find this element on the page? Like, for years at Selenium Conf, there was always a talk about, like, how do I do element locators? And if I could farm that out to an AI, that would be brilliant. So I could then focus on continuing to write. There's, there's another interesting things. Sorry. There's another yeah. thing that I, um, as far as like a, a good AI uh, application of a tool, there was a um, release from the engineering team at Uber. And they talked about, I think it was called Jag Dragon Crawl. And they specifically talked about it, the self-healing feature. Um, uh, it, ironically, if you if you uh, ask uh, your favorite um, large language model, what are the top problems in testing? Frequently, the top one will show up is like flaky tests, um, right? And uh, if you had a, a tool that specifically, it's a com combination of flaky tests and also self healing. A lot of vendors kind of talk about that that they they have a magic AI tool that can fix that. I think that's that's very interesting. That's kind of like a subset of just writing all the tests. Is I'm very interested. I've got a particular project that I'm on that like. I would love to be able to inject a self-healing thing. So instead of just trying it three times and it finally deciding to, to fail it, that's where we engage the AI to see if it can kind of, uh, instead of just failing the test, uh, engage some kind of, um, you know, otherwise usually you would have a, a person who would say like, okay, pause everything. I'll just take over control and see if I can save the test, right? Or save the internet, whatever. I can imagine a, a an AI could probably, there's some probably magic in there for self-healing solving the flaky test issue, which is kind of a subset of the entire thing. Anyway, it's definitely exciting stuff. I'm not completely dismissive of the AI things. Do we still have time for more questions or are we like people need to get, go home? <laughs> uh, well, since this was our last session, uh, we thought it would be good to get all the questions answered here. So okay. if you want to listen sure. to if, I mean, if there's people still uh, listening to yeah. us uh, ramble on, then yeah, sure. Why not? Still Are there any plans for WebDriver by Dai to be integrated with Appium and to be used with mobile browsers on real devices? Um, if it's a browser, then I sincerely hope so. Um, for Appium, one of the things that um, we have tried to ensure is that the building blocks you need to do something like Appium remain in WebDriver by Dai. Um, so Jim Evans put in a huge amount of effort to make sure that um, the equivalent of find element was present inside WebDriver by Dai as a separate, um, they call them modules, part of the spec specification. Um, and that's going to be super important because the alternative was like, oh, just do everything in JavaScript. Want to find an element? Send a bit of JavaScript and evaluate that. And that's great if everything is a browser with JavaScript. Um, but it's not great if you're Appium. It's not great if you're trying to access um, accessibility nodes or, or anything like that. Um, and so having those sort of building blocks with sort of one eye open in the spec of how might people use this to do mobile testing um, is something that sort of certainly Jim, uh, amongst other people, have made a real effort to ensure happens. So the building blocks are there for Appium to adopt it if it needs to, but I think it will take some work. Yeah, and and the, the, the whole... Um... The idea behind Appium was to ride the coattails of the web driver spec and API and ecosystem. So um, I would like to keep that party going. Um, it's, <laughs> it's bold of me since I'm not day-to-day -day writing code on Selenium or Appium to make proclamations on their behalf. But I would I would express my interest that Appium stays um, uh, close to the, the web driver and specifically the Baidai stuff. I think we answered that one question, that question? I hope we did. Um, okay. So the final Ooh, question we is... we got a good one from Naresh. Uh, my understanding is both uh, Jason and I um, are not big fans of end-to-end -end UI tests, uh, which is ironic okay. given the project, right? Uh, instead, you prefer writing tests at lower levels of the test pyramid. So what frameworks of testing approach do you prefer for That's these funny. lower levels of test? I, um, I suspect Naresh actually has a good answer for this one, right? He's got I think, some <laughs> opinions. I would, I would, I don't... I'm not sure. I guess uh, I've said a lot of words over the years. I'm not not a fan of end to end tests. I think what it, where it usually comes down to is we're not a fan of only end to end tests or doing or kind of overdosing on it, right? Um, so it's kind of like just the right amount, like everything in moderation, including moderation, is is the <laughs> is the phrase. Um, that's the line from my free, one of my co founders from from Sauce. Um, so. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think I, I think it's still true though. It's hard to get anyone to write one test. If you add, if you just get a hundred developers off the street, like I don't think all of them have written a test. Period. Whether it's small or big, end to end, unit, whatever. Um, there's still a lot of uh, cowboy coding. There's still a lot of manual testing. Um, there's a, still a lot of like let's get our um, you know the the kids down the street to try it out. Um, so some of these arguments, uh, it's kind of, you know, becomes academic, right? I think, um, so I think it's, it's still important to get people to write any kind of test. And if they do that, I'm a fan, regardless of whether it's a big or a small test. Um, anyway, also, I think, uh, it's, it's funny. The test pyramid is, is a controversial idea these days. Um, and it's gotten, it's taken on a life of its own. There's like, test ice cream cones, then inverted pyramids. There's like, there's all kinds of testing polygon shapes. I don't even know what state of the art is on the shape of the testing thing. So mm -hmm. I would love to talk with Naresh on, on what he uh, suggests about frameworks and testing tools, but I'm, I'm just more of like, Hey, if you do a testing at all, I'm a fan. So uh, adding to that, like the thing that I like to do is consider why are we writing tests in the first place? Like, if we're not going to listen to the results, we might as well delete them. If we don't trust the results, we might as well just delete them. Um, the reason why we write tests is to know that a change is safe to put into production. Um, and we can never be completely sure that any change is safe to put in, to, to be put into production. Bugs always slip through, but we try and minimize the risk. Um, and so our tests need to provide feedback in a timely manner. So the other thing I'm a huge fan of is fast feedback loops. So... I like the idea of end-to-end -end tests existing because they test that the entire stack works, but I don't like them because they lengthen the feedback loop um, and they lack precision when they go wrong. So when an end-to-end -end test fails, you don't know what actually happened. All you know is that something in the stack didn't work. Whereas at the other end of the scale, if you're doing like a teeny tiny little unit test and this method fails, then you know right. the problem is in that method somewhere and you can figure it out really quickly. Um, so the combination of like fast feedback loops and carefully focusing on um, what the tests are going to, which tests are going to bring the most value and which ones will allow you to push to production with confidence. Uh, that's the, the the assessment I tend to make. And for me, that assessment does end up being like you end up with the testing pyramid with a large yeah. number of small tests that can be run very quickly and relatively few end-to-end -end tests that take a long time. There are tech -tech cases where that isn't appropriate, however, like the Selenium project itself, runs a lot of end-to-end -end tests for the very good reason that it's quite hard to test all the stuff we do without firing up a browser and making sure that it implements like these parts of the spec um, and that each of the language bindings is working the way we expect it to as well. Um, so I'm not a fan of end-to-end -end tests, but they have their time and their place. Uh, and the thing that we always have to do is make sure we have timely feedback to enable us to push safely. Yeah, I think there should be a book written about like, me testing metaphors. I've got a bunch of them, so I, but I'm sure there's a million more. Um, and one of them to riff on what just Simon said is that um, end to end tests are like a fire alarm. Specifically, they can tell you that something is wrong, but it can't tell you where. Um, but then if you maybe put a fire alarm in every corner at some point, they it it might tell you where and it, 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 it's, it becomes kind of like this ridiculous argument, right? I think you kind of need sensors everywhere and you need a fire alarm to kind of get everyone's attention. Um, I've heard this like as like, that's literally the mic drop um, criticism against a, an end-to-end -end test. Like, well, I can't tell you where things are failing. It's like, well, does that mean, I mean, the same thing as like a, a fire alarm can't tell you where in the building the fire is. Does that mean we should rip out all the fire alarms? Like, no, <laughs> they they still serve a purpose. They They make you stop in your tracks and go, huh? Right. Um, so it's it's kind of like a balanced breakfast going back to the food pyramid, right? Um yeah, anyway. That that's my thing. <laughs> Your end to end tests are a fire alarm. Um, what you do with it, uh you, you know, I guess go look up the history of firefighting to figure out Just what what's the good mix of the, the things. One final thing. Um as like uh Helsoy at Selenium Conf did a really good test uh, talk on how to scale your tests to make them run really, really quickly. So it's sub microsecond end-to-end -end tests. Um, so go go look for ASLAC and Selenium Conf and watch that video.
because it's brilliant. And the, the main thing he focuses on is the application of the hexagonal architecture to your testing uh, code. Um, if you're not a developer, that may have just been a lot of noise, uh, a lot of words, but it's a really interesting talk and it's super seeing something go from the same test run in under a millisecond to taking tens of seconds. I, I'm looking at the uh, webinar chat and there's some really uh, spicy takes here, but uh, I would love to talk with Benjamin <laughs> Bischoff. Uh, I really dislike self-healing. I really want to talk to you. I really want to change your mind because I want to convince you to um, help me fix the uh, I think I think the problem is a lot of people oversell these words and then they become, you know, everything is the cloud. Everything is AI, everything, whatever. Um, but I think there's some actually good stuff here, whatever. Anyway, I, I'm super appreciative for everyone is staying all these extra innings here for our, our talk. Um, I hope I hope any some of this was uh, <laughs> interesting and educational. Yes, I would second that. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, thank you for your time and your patience. It definitely was very insightful and the different perspectives, right? Whether it's a fast feedback loop or the context that is there, end-to-end -end test is good, pyramid I don't like or for these reasons or whatever it is, right? There's so much context behind it. It's not one rule fits for all, right? You have to apply it in the context. The test has to be valuable as Simon said, is the test really required? What type of feedback is it giving? Can it be a small unit test or end-to-end -end test? You can't just get an answer directly, right? You have to put it in the you have to step into those shoes, understand that context, and then take the decision that is going to help you move forward. Thank you very much, Jason and Simon. This you know, there couldn't have been a better end to yet another Selenium conference. Really appreciate you staying back uh, more uh, than what the scheduled time was. Thank you to all the participants, the attendees all the questions that were there. Hope you had a fantastic day, a lot of learning, a lot of interesting ideas. The sessions that you could not attend because of parallel tracks, those videos will be available soon on YouTube. The videos will be also linked from the proposal page in Conf Engine itself, so you can easily find it. Again, thank you very much, everyone. Keep learning, keep interacting, and keep sharing. See you again next time.